Welcome to Liberty Ministries Church. We're so glad everybody's here in the congregation tonight, and we pray that you won't leave here tonight without you get every need met. And the same for our audience on the Internet. I pray that God will bless you and meet your need. Every spiritual thing that you need tonight coming from God, I ask you to receive it as coming from God tonight in Jesus' name. We're going to start off with worship, but first of all, I would like to, for us to open in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this great privilege of being able to come to your house and to worship together in this free nation, Father. We know that many of our brothers and sisters out there on the Internet, Father, are in persecuted churches, per persecuted countries for Christians, Lord. And I ask you now in Jesus' name that you would just touch those people, that you would minister to them, that you would give them freedom to worship, and we thank you for the worship freedom we have here, Lord. And we ask you now, Holy Spirit, to come and take charge of this service. I ask your blessings upon the music, the musicians, the singers, and everyone that's involved, even those back in the sound room, Father, in the media. I pray, God, that you would bless them, that we would all be able to fall in place with what the Holy Spirit wants to do tonight. Holy Spirit, you're so welcome. You're so welcome here in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Everybody stand. Come on. Magnify Jesus. Magnify the Lord. 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 Come to magnify. We 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 come
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, he is holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Yes. Worthy to receive glory. Oh, he is worthy to receive all.
and it flows from Emmanuel's hands. It came and it healed me. It came and refreshed me. It came and washed my sins away. I will rejoice. I will rejoice. like this. We love you, Lord. Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. For your arms hold us. Your mercy. Keeps us. 
love you, Jesus. soul, mind, and strength, God. We love you, Father. Hallelujah, Jesus. We love you, Father. Thank you for your touch, God. Thank you for your spirit that's in this place tonight. Hallelujah. Would you put that song back up there, Nathan? Hallelujah. Just for we need to do it again. Hallelujah. Just sing it to him. Just sing it to God. Hallelujah. From the beginning, I'll, we love you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Sing it with me, choir. We love you, Lord. Tell it like you mean it. We love you, Jesus. For
Thank you for loving us, God. Hallelujah. You're so Praise you, Lord Jesus. You are so worthy, Lord, to be praised. We worship you tonight. We thank you for the presence, your holy presence. Holy Spirit, you're so welcome here. Thank you, Jesus. I know, Lord, that you've received our praise and our worship tonight. It was like a sweet fragrance coming up to your throne room tonight, Lord. The Word says it is. We love worshiping you. We love praising you. We especially love to be able to be in your presence, to feel your arms around us and know that everything is okay because you said it was. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. You can be seated. I'd like to ask the ushers now if they would come and receive God's tithes and our offerings. Let's give these ushers a hand clap tonight. They're so faithful. Praise the Lord. <coughs> Brother Ronnie, would you pray? Thank you, Melissa. Wasn't the music beautiful tonight? Amen. <coughs> well, we have two ladies here tonight. One is going to share the word, and the other is going to share testimony. And um, we uh, we got the big time preacher with us. She'll be coming at blast. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Some of you may not know the joke, but it's not really a joke. Amen. Betty, would you come and share what the Lord's laid on your heart tonight? God bless you. 
Well, the only where to start is the beginning. Um, I'm going to share some of, well, my testimony with you tonight. And um, I pray that it helps someone that's here or on the Internet. Um, I was born, well, I, my parents had two daughters, and um, that my father wanted a son. And uh, after they had this son, they weren't going to have any more children. That was it. They wanted just one son and to the two daughters they had. And so my mother got pregnant, and she had a son. And my dad was so excited. And uh, my brother was two months and 26 days old, and he died. My mother found him in the bed with her. So it really, really um, hurt my dad and mom real bad. So they decided they were going to have one more child, and that was it. And they had another one, and it was me. And it wasn't a boy, but God meant for me to be here. When I was born, uh, the cord was wrapped around my neck three times, and I was what they called a blue baby. As soon as I hit the air, I had a, a veil over my face and of skin, and they had to jerk it off and be really quick about it, or you would have smothered to death. So that's the first time God intervened in my life. Um, I grew up, um, my dad was gone most of the time, and, uh, and in the process they had two boys and another girl. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't have much to eat. I remember going without food a lot of times. Um, I don't remember if my dad was working or if he wasn't. If he was working, the money wasn't coming in for us. Um, I was sick a lot when I was little. I ended up in the hospital a good bit. Um, I had pneumonia every time the fall of the year. I would take pneumonia, and I was real, real sickly. Um, I remember that um, one time we had not had anything to eat in about three days. Um, my sister, my oldest sister, we lived in a house where there was uh, one road, one road in and one road out. So if anybody was coming to our house, we knew when the lights would be coming up the road. She was maybe, there was two years difference than all of us, and she was maybe, I don't know, nine, ten years old, little. And she said she stood there in the window, and she said, Lord, please let somebody bring us something to eat. And she said she looked up, and she saw car lights coming up the road. It was my aunt had got a cab and came over there and brought us food. This was the second time that I, re that I know of, of God intervening. And in my life, I know he always has. So we had something deep that night. And uh, I remember I was so excited. It was, it was buttermilk and cornbread. And I had mine in a jar, and I'm stirring it. I'm so excited. And I stirred the bottom out of mine, and it fell out in the floor. And I remember my mother gave me her part. And so she didn't eat that night. And no. Uh, as time went on, I remember um, my little brothers went out and got us a Christmas tree one year. They weren't but about four or five years old, and it, it looked like a Charlie Brown tree, and they were so excited over this little tree. And uh, we had a kerosene heater in the kitchen in the living room where the tree was, and somehow or another it caught on fire and burned up. And, uh, and my uncle bought us a Christmas tree. And um, I remember my this man, and I know this was God, this man came to our house, and we were gone, but my oldest sister was there, and he brought food. And uh, I remember my sister, June, she grabbed up a bunch of bananas, and she couldn't believe that they all came more than one. And she said, look how many they are. Because we'd only seen one at a time, and this was a whole bunch of them. And we were so excited, and this man kept coming back. God had to send that man there because he was from some church. I don't, I don't know which one it was. I don't remember. But um, I remember he took my brothers and sisters and had their teeth fixed. And, of course, I was sick. I couldn't go. But he took them to get their teeth fixed. And um, all during my life, I remember God intervening for me over and over again. 
I remember I remember I left home as soon as I could because when I went to school, people made fun of the clothes I wore because my oldest sister had them, then my second sister had them, and then by the time I got on, they had a hem about this long. And uh, I remember going to school, and I had a, an ingrown toenail, and it had gotten so bad I, I didn't know. I had to cut the hole out in my tennis shoe, and, and it was sore for about a year or two. And I learned to play soccer with my left foot because I couldn't use my right foot. And uh, I remember I went to, I was picking my ear one time, and I must have scratched it, and I went swimming, and, and uh, wa- my ear swelled, and water got in my head, and I had to go to the doctor every day for, I guess, for three weeks to take a shot, and because it had to drain the water out of my ear and, and all, and it done something to my eardrum. And... Um, uh, God was there with me too because they said I couldn't wouldn't be able to hear any more out of it, but I can hear some. Uh, I got a, I got I, as I grew up, I got married thinking you know that I'd have somebody to help me and I could have a house and a bed to sleep in because when we were little, we had a shotgun house and you could stand in the kitchen and look straight out the front door. That's just how the rooms were and my sister June slept on the couch and. My mom and, and my other sister slept in a, a, a big bed, and then my brothers was on a twin bed, and then my sister and I were on top of the twin bed, so they'd kick us most of the night. But that's how we slept in one room. And uh, I'm thinking I'll have a bed and I'll have my own house and everything's going to be fine. And Well, it didn't work out that way. Um, a couple of months after I got married, my husband's, I need to make this clear. This Donnie had nothing to do with this. I did not know Donnie then. I'd never met him before. So Donnie had nothing to do with any of this. But this man slapped me, and, and it just blew me away. I, I, this, this hurt me so bad. He began to cry and tell me he was sorry, and naturally I forgive him. You know, this is my husband. He loved me. He wouldn't hurt me. So we moved to Maryland. And when we moved to Maryland, everything changed. He began to beat me really, really bad. And um, I was trying to get away from him one time, and I was running down the road, and I seen him coming in the car. And I had nowhere to hide. I had nowhere to go. And he hit me with the car and knocked me out of the road. And um, I don't guess it hurt me. I didn't go to the hospital. God was there again. Um... He knocked me down on the floor one time, and he was going to stomp my head, but I rolled just in time, and he stopped the floor. He took his fingernails, and he come down both sides of my face like this, taking the skin off my face. One time he took a clothes rack, and he come down my back with it. He, um, he tried to stick my hand in a fan, he hit me in the eye and chipped my cheekbone, and my left eye sits a little bit further back in my head than my other one from where he hit me. When we moved back to South Carolina, I tried to, I, I couldn't see my family. He wouldn't let me near my family. Uh, I would go months at a time without seeing them or talking to them because I'd have places on me and they would know something was wrong. When I wanted to go home and see my mother, he would tell me if I went home and I said anything, he would kill him. And he hit me one time in the leg with a ball bat and uh, broke the veins in the side of my leg. Uh, I just, he let me go to my mom's one day and uh, I had on a, a pair of pants and it, the ball, where he had hit me with a ball bat, it had a big old place on it and she saw it. She asked me what happened and I had to lie to her. I couldn't tell her the truth. He would only let me stay for just a little while, and then he would come back and get me. There was no man at my, my house. My mom raised seven children by herself, so there was no one there. If I told her anything, he would hurt her. When it would get so bad, I would, I would find a way to get away. And one point, I had left, and I was standing at my mother's, and he came in the middle of the night and emptied a gun in the front yard and shot one window and one one round in the house. 
back then the law didn't do anything. They'd just tell you to get a gun and protect yourself. That's all they did. He, um, he would hide under the floor. He would, uh, my mom was going down to my grandmother's one night, and he bounced up on the curb and tried to run over. And uh, the law just didn't seem to do, do anything to him. At one time, I got away and I got home. It's just as if there was nowhere I could go hide. I went home, and, and uh, he would just harass my family. He, he just he threatened all of them's lives. He threatened to wait until we were all in one place, and then he'd burn the house down. And I, I really believe he would have if, if it hadn't have been for God. I really believe he would have. But all during my life, God has, has always been there for me. I remember at the very end, I'd been in this for eight years. I'd had to hide under the floor. I've slept under the bed. He would, um, at night, he'd take all my clothes off or rip them, tear them off or whatever and throw me outside. I would have to sleep outside or wherever. There just didn't seem to be anybody that could help me. And I wasn't a Christian. I remember I left a part out. When I was about eight years old, I went to the Red Show Club, the Salvation Army. The bus came by. This was my first encounter with God. I got saved that night, and I remember on the way home, somebody hit the bus. And I remember thinking, oh, God, I'm so glad I got saved. But as I got older, I got away from him. So one day I was out, I took some trash out. I wasn't allowed to open the windows. I couldn't have a telephone or car. I couldn't go out of the house whatsoever. I would, he would lock me up in the closet sometime. And uh, I would have to stay there a while. And during this time, we had two boys, and he would take them off on Sundays and ride them around, but I, I wasn't allowed to go. I had to stay home in the house. He, um, one day I went out to the garbage can while they were gone. I knew if he caught me out, I, it would be bad, but I went anyway, and I found a Bible laying by the garbage can. And uh, it wasn't one of mine. I'd never had a Bible. And I know God had somebody to lay it there for me. I know he did. And I picked it up, and I'd never seen a Bible before. Nobody in my family went to church. And I was, um, I was reading the Bible, or looking at it. Somebody had written all in it. And uh, I began to read the Bible, and, and I thought, man, you know, I, I'd like to go to church. I really would like to go to church. So I asked him if he'd take me to church, and he did. He took me and took me and my oldest little boy. He was he was five then. And uh, I remember when they started singing, he was quiet. And then when they started praying, he wanted to sing. So he was kind of noisy. But I went down to the altar that night, and I asked Jesus in my heart. And I remember coming out, and I looked up, and the stars were so bright, and the sky was so beautiful. But the beatings kept on. They didn't, they didn't stop. Um... I went, um, he wouldn't take me back to church anymore. That was it, just that one time. And so I would keep reading the Bible, and uh, I asked him if he would go to a counseling, some kind of counseling with me, you know, and uh, he said he would go. So he went one time, and and I told him, you know, I said, you need to let me keep going. If you don't, they may come check on us. I was trying to scare him so I could keep going. I wasn't really telling the psychiatrist anything. I was just, just there just to get away. And um, he kept talking to me, and he told me, he said, you're at the point now where if you don't leave, if you don't do something, you'll kill him. You don't care. You, it was an everyday life. It was normal for me to get beat up. And um, so I got to thinking about, I have two children. I need to do something. I can't. Let them be raised in this, and I can't kill him because if I do, then I'll never see my boys again. So I, um, I began to pray, and I began to ask God to help me do something, work out something. And so one day, 
uh, I asked him if I could go see my mother. And he said, yeah, I'll come get you in an hour. So I called my sister, and she came and got me. During the meantime, I had uh, packed all my boys' clothes that they wore, and the clothes they didn't wear I left in the drawers because I didn't want him to know I was leaving. So I threw all the clothes that we were going to wear in, in a trash bag and threw them up on the floor and because uh, I knew I wasn't coming back. And so whenever uh, I left, he came over in an hour to get me. And he said, uh, are you going home? And I said, no. And Dusty, my youngest boy, had already gotten in the car with him. And he started crying. He said, Mommy, and I know it was God, he set him out on the cement. Because if he hadn't, I would have had to go back home with him. I couldn't leave Dusty. So he set him on the cement. And... Uh, I scooped him up and went in the house. And after that, he shot, he raised Cain. He, I hid for three months until my divorce was final. And uh, then one day, um, a friend of mine picked me up at work. And as we were coming down White Horse Road, he started ramming into the back of us in his car. And he knocked my son, my oldest one, in the floor and blacked his eye. And... Uh, we made it to the police department. We ran every red light till we got down to the police department, and there was a robbery going on at that time, so there was no police there except the desk sergeant. And I went running in there, and I tried to tell him what was wrong, and by the time I got out there, they was already fighting, and my kids were in the car. And uh, the policeman came out, and he said, um, what happened? And my oldest little boy pulled on his shirt, he said, my daddy ran into us, look, and showed him his eye. And that was it. The policeman wouldn't listen to anything. He was saying we hit him, but his paint was on my car, so they knew he hit us. And so they took him to jail. And uh, on and off, he, he would just harass us, and we would have to ride. He'd ride behind us with the lights out in his car and, and just, you know, until this day, this man's still living, <laughs> you know. But all the way through my life, God has been there. And all I can say is if anybody is in an abusive relationship, they're not going to change. Once they hit you, unless they ask Jesus into their heart, they're not going to never change. It's going to be the same, and they may end up killing you. And when, like the psychiatrist told me, he said he was like Hitler. He would hit me, and then he would start crying and asking me to forgive him. But when he killed me, he could stand over me and cry all day, and it wouldn't bring me back. It wouldn't do any good. So if there's anybody out there in a relationship like that, I, I encourage you to get out one way or the other. Um, there's one thing I did leave out. My dad, um, when I was six and a half years old, he went off one night, and, well, he was going off, and for some reason I didn't want him to go, and um, I went to the... The, the door and I followed him out and I was swinging around the post on the door and I, he was fixing to get in the car with two men and I asked him, I said, don't go, Daddy. I'd never asked him to stay home. I'd never cried before. And he turned around and came back and picked me up and brought me in the house and he said, he told my mother, he said, keep her in the house and make sure these boys go to school and, and all of them get a good education. My dad walked out the door that night and he never came home. Some those men jumped on him and killed him. He never came home again. And so I grew up thinking if I had made him stay home, this wouldn't have happened if I could have just kept him home. And as a kid, the devil tormented me with that. It was my fault. I would dream that I would see him going by. He'd wave at me, but he wouldn't stop. And so all through my life, that's what I went through was I could have kept him home. But in reality, I couldn't keep him home. It wasn't my fault. So like Jeanette did when, when her grandpa died, I had to forgive my daddy for leaving me because I was mad. He left me when he could have stayed home and lived, but he left. So I had to forgive him, and uh, just like I had to forgive my ex-husband. I, uh, I pray that sometime in his life he finds the Lord. The last time I heard he hadn't. But I know that everybody's got a testimony. I know everybody goes through something. But this is mine. This is, this is just some of mine. I, uh, 
a lot of times, that like the psychiatrist told me, he said a lot of times you'll be just doing nothing and something will pop up in your head is the way he treated me or things he done to me. I've suppressed a lot of them down and I don't, I don't care to remember them. But sometimes they do come up, but when they do, I give them to the Lord because he was there with me the whole time, just like when I was born with the food, with the, with the Bible. And he'll be with you. You just have to trust him and ask him into your heart. Thank you. junk up here before it falls on the floor and my hands full <coughs> okay <laughs> you know I told the Lord tonight I, you know I was kind of like I just don't know that I can do this but I can do it I've done it before and I've done it several different times overseas and there are different anointings and tonight I don't have that anointing on me that evangelist anointing on me that to preach like a crazy person <laughs> but I have done that <coughs> you heard Jeanette call me big time preacher I'm going to share with you what that all that's about because some of you probably don't know, some of you do. But I went to preach in this little village, and I went in this church, and I kept telling that man, I said, now look, I don't want to go up there on that big podium. I mean, it was beautiful, real nice. And I didn't want to go up on that podium, and I did not want to preach up there. I said, just let me get down here with the people. You know, I feel more comfortable. So if I want to do something, I can do it. Sometimes I just, I'm spontaneous. Things happen, and I don't even know why. They just do, and I've done it and don't know why I did it. It just happens. And so this man, he said, oh, no, no, you don't think that's beautiful? And I'm like, yeah, I think it's beautiful, but, I, you know, just let me be down here. He says to me, he said, no, you big-time preacher. You like Benny Hinn. And I'm like, you talk about blowing somebody away. Now, this man blew me away. And so that, that's what they're laughing at me about tonight. <laughs> but tonight, I've, I have prayed all day. I preached to myself all night. But I'm going to tell you something. God is good. You'll never convince me that he's not. I know that he's given me a word for the church tonight. It may not be for here. You may not be the one it's for. It may be for the internet. I don't know. But I know God gave me a word. He spoke to me. I preached to myself all night last night. I woke up preaching to myself. I preached all day to myself. And you know what? When I got here, it left. <laughs> it left. I want to talk on faith tonight. You know, I, I'm not comfortable standing up here. I want to move. I want to get away from here. I don't understand why. I just do that. I walk a lot. <clears throat> Listen, we're going to talk about faith tonight. The Lord told me to share with you things that I had been through and the things that God had done for me. You know, it's been told to me several times that I was a woman of faith. And I believe that. You can't go through some of the things that I've been through and not have faith in God. You know, I, I don't claim to be anything in, except that I love the Lord and that I serve him with my heart and my soul. And I want to serve him in an even more intimate way than what I've already served him. I'm sure everybody out there wants the same thing. <clears throat> In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now faith is the, <clears throat> the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You know, when uh, 
to start off with, when I was, when I first got saved, my, my oldest son, he decides to go to work at the age of 15, and he goes to Tucker's Soda Shop now. I don't know if any of you know about Tucker's Soda Shop or not, but Tucker's Soda Shop is, uh, it was the hangout for everybody. And uh, we hung out down there. That's where we, we ate hamburger steak, french fries, and gravy. That's what we ate. And we hung out there. Had a good time. That's where I raised my kids, right there at Tucker's Soda Shop. <laughs> well, anyway, my oldest son worked there. And for, uh, you know, maybe three, four months, he just, you know, he was fine. There was, there was no problem there. Well, one day he came home and he said, Mom, listen, he said, they told me I got to go to the doctor and I got to have a tuberculosis test. And I said, okay. I said, I can do that because, you know, he'd already had one, but I thought, okay, we can do it. So we go to the health department the next day. We get the tuberculosis test done. And, you know, it's that little round thing they put on your arm, you know, they stick it up under the skin. They tell you if it gets red, you better get back to them. Well... Bumper kept saying to me, he said, Mama, he said, this is bothering me. And he just kept messing with it, messing with it. And he kept squeezing it. And I said, leave it alone, boy. You're going to bruise your arm. Well, the next morning, he comes out and he said, I told you, Mama, there's something wrong. And he had this round, you know, it was red. And I thought, well, you know, I'm not going to let that worry me. That, that's just not, you know. So anyway, I waited another day. He come in there the next morning. He said, Mom, look at my arm. And this time it was big. He had a big red circle. And so we went to the health department. Well, no, we went to the doctor. My doctor said, no, you, go to, you take him back to the health department because those are the people that are going to treat him because they don't, doctors don't treat that anymore. And so I said, okay. So it scared me. It scared me real bad. And Betty and I had long been friends. We just met, hadn't we? And Betty said, she said, oh, I know what you need. She goes and she comes back with a handful of tapes and a book by Jerry Seville. And it was something about, something about faith, how to keep the devil from stealing your faith or something. If he can't steal your joy, he can't steal your faith. Something like that by Jerry Seville. But anyway, let me tell you, I started pumping them tapes. Oh, Lord, I... I'd go to the health department and they'd tell me he's got tuberculosis. And I was like, no. And I'd run back home and I'd get on the couch. I'd say, God, no, he can't have tuberculosis. No, he don't have tuberculosis. And I did this for a year. For a solid year, they kept telling me, oh, he's got tuberculosis. He, and they kept saying he had a spot this big around on his lungs. I said, no, he don't. No, he don't. I said, God's word says he's healed. That nurse looked at me. She said, honey, you can say that all day long, but I'm telling you, your son's got tuberculosis. I said, no, he don't. And I was hard-headed. You know, I, I believe what I believe. If you don't believe what you believe, you're in trouble. I believe what God's Word said. He said my son was healed, and he was healed. And I believed that. And there wasn't nobody going to take that away from me because I knew he was healed. So... Here we go back to the drawing board. I'd go to the health department, and they had him on all kind of medicine. And that nurse said to me one day, she said, listen, she said, I need to know if he's having these symptoms. And so I stayed up at night to see if he was having the symptoms. Yes, he was. Every symptom, every symptom that people with tuberculosis have, my son had. And I said, I'm, you know, I kind of was taken back. I said, no, God. This can't be true. You said you healed him. And I, I kept, you know, I just, I just kind of was getting confused. And, and I, I didn't know what to do. And so I went back and I got them tapes. And I started pumping them tapes again. Pumping them tapes in me. And I kept reading the word. And I kept believing. And I kept saying, God, I know you're faithful. I know you're faithful. You're not going to leave me here like this. You're going to heal my son. And Betty was coming, and we were praying together at night, and uh, we would fast. I'm going to tell you something. You let the devil get a hold of one of your kids and see how fast you give up that food. Uh, you know, it didn't seem to bother me then, buddy. I let it go. 
And it wasn't nothing to fast then. But I needed something from God. And I needed it from my son. Because I didn't want my son to die. And eventually that stuff will kill you. And this long, drawn-out suffering thing, I didn't want him to go through that. And so I got on my hands and knees, and I prayed, and I prayed. We fasted, we prayed, and we did all kind of stuff. But I want you to know, we go back to the, it's it's about, I think about three months before the end of the year was out. We walked back in there, and the, the doctors over all the South Carolina the lung doctors come in there and they take x-rays of my son again. And that doctor, he just looked at me and he told me that nurse, evidently the nurse must have talked to him. But he told me, he said, listen, he said, don't get your hopes up. And I looked at him and I told him, I said, God heals. He heals. And I believe that my son's healed. I said, I don't know how and I don't know when, but he's healed. And so, they made me sit outside. They took my son, went and done x-rays, and they talked with him or whatever they were going to do, you know. Well, they come back out there and get me a couple minutes later, and that nurse said, you better get in here. You better get in here. And I mean, she was mad, just real ugly. Grabbed me by the arm, trying to drag me down there, and I was trying to be dignified and walk right. And she <laughs> got a hold of my arm. She drug me down that hall. The doctor looked at me. He said, Miss Brown, he said, this boy ain't got no tuberculosis. He said, that ain't nothing but a shadow on that x-ray. He said, that boy ain't got nothing. Ain't nothing wrong with him. And I looked at that doctor and I said, I tried to tell all of you, he's healed. But now let me tell you, he had every symptom, every symptom of tuberculosis. He coughed, he had the night sweats, he had all of that. But I knew, I knew that the devil, I knew he was trying to pull the wool over my eyes. God don't, you know, when you're seeking God and you love him and you're trying to do everything you know to do with all your heart, God's not going to fail you. Now, there are times when you don't get a healing. I don't know why, but there are times when you don't get a healing. But that was one of the times that I did get a healing. And I knew in my heart, but it was hard. I struggled for that year to hold on to the faith that God had healed my son. But there's been a lot of times that I've struggled with a lot of things. I've done a lot of things in my life that, you know, most of us have. We've done things that are not good. But I thank God for every time he's brought me through Uh, It wasn't too long ago that uh, these people that lived back behind me, behind my house, let me tell you, they were really funny. I didn't want to be friends with them. I didn't like them, and I wasn't going to be friends with them, wasn't going to be neighborly. I just would, I'd speak, you know, and just keep on going like it wasn't nothing. And (laughs) I just didn't want to get tied up with them because people, these people, they like to, let me borrow a cup of sugar. You got some money I can borrow? You know, that's the kind of people they were. And so I didn't want to get tied up. And so I, I deliberately, I'd wave, I'd smile. Their little kids throwing their toys in the yard, and I'd throw their little toys right back. And that little boy told me, he said, don't you tell me not to do that no more. I said, son, oh, if you only knowed, I'd come over and smack you. Wah, 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 wah. That's what I felt like doing. But anyway... I said, okay, Lord. And so <clears throat> one day I go out in the backyard, and there's this woman out there, and she's tearing this house all to pieces, tearing the clothes off the clothesline, and she's cussing, and she's going crazy. I thought it was her sister, so I didn't, you know, I didn't say anything. I didn't bother her. I just watched her. I was over there trying to put up stuff to the pool, get it closed up and everything, because wintertime was coming, you know. wanted to get that mess done. And so I look over there. And lo and behold, that girl, she just took a thing and started hitting on this TV and trying to bust the front of the TV out. And I mean, she went in the house and she brought stuff out of the house and threw it on the ground. And I mean, she was just destroying stuff. And all of a sudden, 
She comes back around the house and she takes this tube before and she just slings it through the back door. And so I thought, hmm, I, I don't know who that is, but, you know, I don't want to get involved. And so I, I didn't want to say anything. I didn't want to get involved. But the Lord was dealing with me and he said, how would you feel if it was your house? And I said, you know, I was standing there watching everything she did. And I said, God, I said, if it was my house, I'd want somebody to stop her. I'd want somebody to call the law. I'd want somebody to do the right thing. And uh, the Lord said, what are you going to do about it? And I said to him, I said, Lord, I don't know. If you give me a minute, because I was really upset. <laughs> So I called Richard. I said, Richard, what do I do? Do I call the law? He said, no, if you call the law, you're going to get it. You, you, you know you're going to trouble. You're going to have to go up there and all kind of stuff. And so I thought, okay. So I, I didn't do anything for a few minutes. And then finally Richard came home, and it was still weighing heavy on my mind that I needed to do something. And so the... The people next door had called the law. She was the lady that had tore the house up. wasn't her sister, and she didn't know her, and she didn't know what was going on. I didn't know what was going on either. Just that this woman just tore this house all to pieces for no reason, and so I kept thinking, God, what do I do? And so finally, uh, this man talked to Richard. And he, the man next door told him. He said that. He knew that I had seen what had happened, wouldn't know what I'd tell the law. And so the law came out to the house, and to make a long story short, I told him. told him everything I saw. And uh, I said, man, I wanted to call the law, and I did. I really wanted to, but I was afraid of getting involved in something that, you know, I'd had people got me involved in all kind of court cases just by living next door to them and being friends to them. And I said, no, I'm not doing this no more. And that's why I was fighting it so bad. But anyway, I did the right thing. The law asked me would I come down the next day and would I pick her out of the lineup and would I, you know, would I tell them what happened, give them a, a deposition, whatever it was. And so I told him, okay. Well, I had to wait all day. At 2 o'clock, I go down there. That's what time the appointment was. I went down at 2 o'clock and... Uh, I can't count how many times that man went over and over and over and over the story that I told him. And I mean, he just kept going over and over and over. And it's like he would try to twist me up on what I said. But I knew what, I knew what the truth was. And anyway, I did all of that. And uh, I, th I, th I was sitting there and I prayed. I said, God, listen. I said, I do not want to pick the wrong person. But I could not remember for the life of me what that woman looked like. And I said, God, don't let me pick the wrong woman. I don't want to send the wrong person to jail. I don't want to tell a lie on somebody. I want to do the truth. I want to do the right thing. So I picked out the woman. I circled it, and I initialed it, and I gave it to him. He never said if it was the right one or not. But within two hours, the lady was in jail. But anyway... We got home, and maybe a week, maybe two weeks went by, and I was at work. Richard come in the back door, and he I, the lady from this side of us come running up to talk to Richard, and she, said, she was telling Richard, she said, there was two boys going up the road today, and she said, they was looking real funny, and she said, I knew something wasn't right with them. And she said, they come down your driveway, and they left with a, your leaf blower, and your chainsaw. She said, but I saw them. And she said, I come up here and I made them put those things back. And I told them if they didn't, I was calling the law on them. Well, I want you to know, let me tell you, had I not done the right thing, the Lord spoke to my heart just as soon as it come out of Richard's mouth. The Lord spoke to me and he said, listen. He said, had you not done the right thing by those people behind you, it could have turned out a lot different. And so I know that when things are not the way you think they should be, 
that if you'll have faith in God and you'll listen to what he's telling you to do, if you'll do the right thing, no matter how hard it is, if you'll do the right thing, God is faithful to take care of you. And so anyway, he brought us, he saved us a couple thousand dollars right there because Richard uses those steel things, very expensive. You know, he's a tree man. He's got to have the best. Know how that goes. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, faith is having trust in God and having the confidence to know, to have that deep down confidence to know that whatsoever you ask him, he's going to bring it to pass. A lot of times we have needs that we don't take to God and we don't get an answer for them. Okay, there are several kinds of faith and, you know, I'm not in order. Everything I got is all messed up tonight, but that's just the way I am. Everything's just, it's never in order. Okay, you know that if faith and belief work hand in hand, it takes faith to believe. You know, a lot of times, Charles, I've been sick too, and I'm faced with a lot of things that I know that only God can help me with. And I believe with all my heart, you can say that you have faith, but a lot of times we get in situations where we don't, know what to do and how to use our faith. I've had to put feet on my faith many a time. I've had to put hands to my faith to see things come to pass. But I knew that it wasn't me. I knew that it was God. You know, the Bible says that faith without works is dead. There's something that we have to do. We have to do our part so God can do his part. Okay, there is delivering faith. You know, when Daniel went into the lion's den, he didn't go in there laughing and carrying on saying, Lord, I'm happy to be here. He went in there believing in his heart that God was going to deliver him. That's just like us. When we face things that we don't know what to do and how to handle them, we have to have faith in God that God's going to handle it for us. You know, about 10 years ago, or, well, it's been about 20 now, maybe more, but my husband can testify to this. He, he knows it's the truth. I had been praying. Back when Betty and I first got together, I was praying. I had this desire to have a home. We didn't have a home. We rented a home, and we had big holes in the floor. <laughs> we lived on the railroad track of all places to live. Anyway... I wanted a home, and I prayed, and I prayed, and, you know, I believed in my heart that God was going to give me a home. I didn't know how it was going to come. You know, I knew you had to pay rent, and you had to do stuff like that, but I wanted a home. I wanted my home, not what somebody else had. I wanted my home. And so I prayed for about 10 years. I prayed. And one afternoon, in the mailbox, we got this little card from Bank of America that said, uh, you know, they had qualified me for $57,000. Man, I like to fell in the floor. I thought I had, you know, I never knew they had that much money in the world. I didn't think they had. And so it just really excited me. And so I thought, oh, this, I, I didn't really believe it. And so... I didn't know that it was God going to touch me and cause my faith to come to work. I didn't know that. But anyway, I called about it, and I told Richard when he come in, I said, man, listen, we got $57,000. We can get us a house. They're going to give it to us. You know, hey, I was excited, very excited. And Richard, it didn't bother him. It didn't bother him at all. So uh, anyway, he, he said, okay, if you can get it, fine. I don't care. If you can get us a house, that's fine. Do what you want. And so 
I got on the phone and I got talking to them in Charlotte and I was giving them information and I, oh man, you talk about a hassle. Now it was a hassle. We had to dig up bills. We had to get this. We had to get that. And I'm praying, God, Lord, I thank you for this house. I thank you, Lord. I'm, I praise you, Lord. I thank you for this house. I believe, God, that you're going to give me this house. I know it's coming, Lord. And I, <laughs> I like drove them crazy. <laughs> I'd get them on the telephone, and I'd tell them. That woman, she'd call me from Charlotte, and she'd say, all right, the loan, you, you got the loan, and you got it at this amount, you know, and this is what the interest is. And uh, maybe three or four months later, she'd say, well, it's done run out. we got to start all over again. And I said, I ain't found a house. I still hadn't found a house. So she says, I tell you what, she said, she got tired of hearing me. She said, listen, she said, I'm going to put you on to a realtor. And I said, okay. So she calls this lady, and this lady's reared back on this big old fine couch. She sends me a picture of herself. She's reared back on this big old fine couch eating chocolates. I said, Lord, she's got her home. And that's my realtor. She sends me four pictures, and the houses she sent me look worse than the one I lived in. I wasn't buying that. No, I wasn't going that way. I looked at that picture. The more I looked at that picture, that woman spread back there on that couch. It made me mad. And so the next day, I looked at them papers and I looked at them houses. And I said, nah, we'll, we'll just go look for myself. And I went on about my business looking for houses. Everything I looked at was too high or too low or it was way over what we could afford, you know. What I wanted was way over what we could afford. So, But I got real nice taste and stuff. And so anyway, the lady from Charlotte calls me. She said, look, she said, I have changed this contract six times. I, and I told her, I said, lady, I said, that woman ain't going to sell me nothing. I said, she's sitting on the couch eating chocolate. I said, she's not selling me nothing. I said, she ain't even returned my call. And I was real angry, you know. I said, she ain't returned my call. I mean, it's like I'm not even here. I said, I want a home. I'm just like you. I want one. I want it yesterday, but I can't get it because I don't know how to go about it. I did everything backwards. I had the contract, but I didn't have the house. Had the money, but no house. And so finally they give me another lady. She returned my call and she said, I can't help you. I said, okay, thank you. So I called Charlotte and I tell that lady up there that's on my loan, I said, listen, I said, she says she can't help me. She don't deal in houses that cheap. I said, I'm sorry. I said, but. You only give me 57000 That's all I got. Man, I thought I had the world in my hand. I did. I never, ever thought there was that much money. <laughs> Not for me anyway. But anyway, we finally, she hooked me up with this real estate lady. That woman came whipping up in my front yard in this big fine Cadillac. She said, are you Marquita Brown? I said, yes, I am. She said, I'm Bobby Johnson. We're going to find you a house. And, buddy, we, we took off. And I'm telling you, we looked day in and day out. And she said, we'll find one. We went to this one house, and there was a man in bed asleep. Now, he pulls the covers up over his head so I can look through the house. And I told her, I said, I don't want this house. We went in another house. And I, I kid you not, the ceiling was falling in. The carpets looked like somebody had just absolutely run all over them. I mean, it was bad. And I said, God, is there not a house for me? And so finally, one afternoon, my friend Bonnie, she said, come on, Marquita. She said, I saw something today I want you to see. And so we jumped in the car. Bonnie and I was notorious for getting in a car, and we didn't know where we were going, and we didn't know where we were coming back. We just went. And Richard will tell you, we did. And so we took off, and I... I said, Bonnie, I said, let's pray before we go. I said, because I'm really, really getting upset about this. And so we prayed. And I said, God, I said, I know. You want me to have a house more than what I do. 
And that's got to be really powerful because I got a hankering for the house that's bad. And so we go up through Woodside, and we, that's where we lived in Woodside. We come around through there, and we go over into Brandon. And I said, okay. And there's some nice places in Brandon. And so we go up this hill on South Street, and I see this house. And I knew, the minute I laid eyes on I knew that that was my house. I knew it was. I got Richard on the phone, and I got Pat on the phone. I said, oh, God, you need need to see this house. Oh, you got to see it. Everything was redone in the house. All the plumbing was brand new. The paint was new. Everything was new. I called Brother Ken on the phone, and I said, man, you got to get over here. you got to look at this house. Tell me it's right for me. I believe it is. But I wanted, I wanted a confirmation, you know. And so, anyway, he was out of town, so he couldn't come. But to make a long story short, it was my house. It was the house that God had for me. $57,000 worth. They wanted sixty for it. We got them down from sixty to fifty-seven. Then I wanted them to let me have it for fifty-five. But it didn't work. I got it for fifty-seven. No, fifty-six. Because we had to pay a thousand on the closing calls, but I got my house. I was so happy. I was dancing up there, having a good time. I was praising God because I knew God gave me that house. I knew he did. And it was so funny. Richard and I, we had a lot of fear about, you know, we couldn't, man, we couldn't afford no five or $600 house payment. Let me tell you something. My house payment started out at $400, four, 430 something. We now pay 500 and some dollars, people. Listen, that may be a little thing for y'all, but I was used to paying rent $135 a month. That's what I was used to paying. That's how, that's how we were. We were that poor. People don't know. I come from a poor background. I wasn't rich. But I knew, I knew that when God... I knew that when he began to work, see, I didn't know that it was God. But as I walked through the steps of getting the house, I could see God's hand in it. I could see what he did for me. You talk about worshiping God. I was, it was awesome. There's been times when uh, you just wouldn't believe the times that the Lord and I have had together. I was so grateful for my home. And, oh, God's just done so many wonderful things to, for me, you know. Let's see. You know, you can have mountain-moving faith. That's what I want. I want mountain-moving faith. I, I've seen God move for me in healing. And there's, there's I, I'm not special. Listen, and I, I don't. I can only share with you what I know. I can't share with you what somebody else knows. I can share with you what I know, what I have knowledge of. And I'm going to tell you, it was hard for me going through that year, you know, or two years, whatever it took me to get the house. I thought that just strained everything I had. But I grew closer to God through that time than I had ever been in my entire life. I drew closer to God. Listen. Uh, you have faith to, uh, Peter had faith to walk on the water. He jumped out of that boat. He didn't think twice about it. Jumped out of that boat. And he walked to Jesus. But when he looked at the wind, he forgot about it. You know, he didn't have faith anymore. He just fell down in the water. Peter also said, God gave him revelation that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. He had to have faith to get that. You have to have faith to believe God for anything. I don't care what it is. You have to have faith. Now, there's a lot of us here. You know, some of us have little bitty faith. Some of us have great faith. Some of us, no faith at all. I hope there's not anybody here like that. But I am telling you, it takes faith to believe in the things of God. I believed for 10 years that God would give me a home. I believed that he would heal my son. I came here 
And when I, I came to this church, Pastor Roy was so good to me. It took him a while to convince me that I belonged here. But I want to tell you something. I came to him one day and I told him, I, I said, uh, I need a car. I didn't have a car. What I had was a little bitty Ford Festiva. Everybody called it Little Red. And I loved Little Red. I drove that thing. I drove the far out of that thing. I drove the wheels off of it. Let me tell you, it blowed up in the middle of White Horse Road on me. And I cried. I called Richard on the phone. I said, Little Red's dead in the road up here. You got to come get me. Well, let me tell you, I had no idea that God was fixing to open some doors for me. I had no idea what faith I was going to have to use. But let me tell you something. I had been seeing for several months, I'd been seeing the back end of this van, and I liked what I saw. I never did see the front of it to know what it was or what kind it was. And for a long time, I'd just be going down the road, and I'd say, oh, God, there it goes, right there. Lord, that's what I want. I love the way that looks. God, that, oh, I would love to have that. God, it'd be so awesome. And I know you love me, and I know you want me to have what I want. And I just really love that van. Well, I didn't know if it was a Honda. I didn't know if it was a Ford. I looked at Betty's, and I thought, okay. I knew what hers was. And so I kept trying to find out what it was, but I never saw the front of the van. I knew in my heart what I wanted. And so I prayed and I asked God. I was real specific about this thing. I thought I had it all covered. I said, Lord, I said, I want this van. I, I want it to have a sunroof in it. I want it to have a TV in it. I want it to have AM, FM stereo in it. I want a uh, CD player in it. I want it to have heat. I want it to have good air because I was tired of freezing in the wintertime and burning up in the summer. And believe me, buddy, you never seen that until you rode in Little Red. But anyway, I loved that car, but I was ready to move on. I was ready to get me something good. And so I began to pray. And I told God, I said, I want the insurance paid up for a month. I want a full tank of gas. I want this thing to be Beautiful blue, and Lord, I just, I can't wait for it. And so let me tell you, I wouldn't, I'd ask Richard to take me, and he wouldn't take me to go look at that van. I had no way of going, and so I couldn't go nowhere and look for a van. And we went to one place in Easley, and we looked for that van, and, but in my heart, I knew it wasn't there. I knew it wasn't there. And so one Saturday, to make a long story short, I'd been praying. I was mad at Richard, very mad, because he was supposed to take me to look at the vans, and he wasn't there. He'd went to work. And so when he came in, I cut him. I told him, I said, I'm mad. You don't take me to look at vans. I'm not going. And so I wouldn't go. I went upstairs. And Richard said, Skeeter, come on. Let's go look at the vans. I'm going to take you. I had to work. But I was mad. And so I said, okay, I'll fix him. Down those stairs we went. I jerked my pocketbook up. I was in a fit of temper. Let me tell you, I'm good at that. I'm bad to have a fit of temper every now and then. But God always calms me down, let me tell you. He really gets me. So anyway, I <laughs> we go looking for bands. We go in this one parking lot, and I'm looking at all these vans and these little cars and everything. Nobody offers to come outside, and I'm like, Richard, I'm, I'm over there talking to myself. He can't hear me because he's in, the van, in, in his truck or whatever we were in. And I was out there talking to myself. Now, I talk to myself. People, I answer myself to. So it, it ain't no problem. If you see me talking to myself, you'll know I just do that. And so I'm out there walking in that parking lot, and I'm getting mad because ain't nobody come out there to see Marquita Brown and tell me about them cars. And so I walked back up there and got in the van. I said, that's it. I'm going home. I was mad. Got in the truck. I said, they don't want to sell these cars here. And so Richard, he, he just like, ah, oh, 
He ride round up and down like this between them cars. I'm ready to leave. They did not want to talk to me. Hey, it's my money. They won't talk to me, no. And so, yeah, I had a really bad attitude. I was mad at Richard anyway. So <laughs> we go down to Breakaway Honda, and I thought, wow, I didn't even know this place existed. I wanted to go out in Spartanburg. That's where I wanted to get my van. That's where I wanted to go. At, at the far edge is the Greer. That's where I wanted to go. And Richard wouldn't take me. And so I, I just felt like that's where God wanted me to go. And when you, when you feel like that's what God wants, you do what you think's right. You do it. Well, he would not understand. I had a plan. I, knew, I thought I knew what I was doing. So what's he do? He takes me to breakaway Honda. I get out of the car, and I'm still huffed up at him. I walk down through there, and the first van, the first van I came to, I'm standing there looking at it, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, this is everything that I want. Man, this is it. This is beautiful. My pastor was standing in faith with me, had been for maybe six years, wasn't it? About six years we stood. But in, before all this happened, I found in a magazine, I found a picture of a Honda Odyssey when I found out what it was. I found a picture of it in a magazine. It was all painted psychedelic. I slapped that thing up on my wall. <clears throat> Every morning when I got up, I said, Lord, that's my van, and I thank you for bringing it to me. I tell him, thank you, Lord, that shiny new blue van, brand new tires, God. I'm going to drive it off the showroom floor. It ain't going to have zero miles on it. It had seven miles on it. That's what it had when I got it because I test drove that baby. I took it all the way to Piedmont to show it to Roy. I said, I said, and I, kept, I was afraid. I kept saying, but it's not coming the way I expected God to bring it. I want it paid for. I didn't want no car payment. I want it paid for. It didn't come that way. It came with a car payment. It came with a big old payment book. And so you know what? I took it. I said, yeah, I'm going to take it. We went down. Roy and Jeanette anointed that thing. We prayed over it. I went back. Now listen, this is the good part. We had $1,000. That's all we had to pay down on this car. And <laughs> earlier, before we ever found out about the car, Ruth and Ronnie let me drive their Honda Odyssey around the parking lot out there so I could feel what it felt like to drive the Honda. <laughs> I'm telling you, I knew that that's what I wanted, and I knew that's what God was going to give me. But let me tell you, we got to Honda. We go in there, and this man, he, he said, I'm going to get this for you. And I said, okay, let's do this thing. Let's sign and drive. Let me go. You know, that's what I wanted. But anyway, I went in there, and I sat down, and Lord, I'm telling you, I've never signed so many papers in my life, and they were talking stuff. I didn't understand compound interest. I didn't understand this. I didn't understand that. I didn't understand the insurance. I didn't want to understand. I just wanted to drive my new van. I just wanted to be in it because I knew. I waited so long. I knew that God had that for me. I knew he had something good for me. And so, anyway, we finally, we got through everything. And this guy tells me, he said, listen, he said, my dad owns this franchise. And this is the guy that sells me the van. And I'm like, okay. I talked to him about God. And he said, uh, before we do anything, he said, uh, let's, go, let's go in here and pray. I thought. This is my type of man. He's on my length. You know, he's on my wavelength here. And so we get in there and we pray. He gets the van for me. I mean, payments down, $615 a month. And I'm like, whoa. I, there was no way, no way that I could make that on what I made a week. Within two weeks, God had turned my whole Everything that I did at work, God turned it around. Instead of doing people for this amount, I was doing it for a yay amount. I mean, I was making the money. It used to take me a month to come up with the car payment. Now, it's there in two weeks. God, that's, the way, that's how God worked. You talk about, I look back and I'd say, God, 
look where you brought me from. And I mean, if I took you back step for step to the places that I've been and that where I lived, you wouldn't believe to see me today. You wouldn't believe where God's brought me and Richard. Oh, man, I was uh, there's so much that he's done for me. Listen, I, I could go on all night with this. You know, it requires faith to sow. You've got to have faith. You've got to believe God for the money to sow. You know, it, <clears throat> there's faith for healing. You know, the Syrophoenician woman, I, I, I really like that about her. I, I just, God was ministering to me through that. I was reading about her, and I thought, hmm. You know, for God to speak, for Jesus to talk to her, it, it was an awesome thing because, listen, the Syrophoenician people, the Jews thought, uh, just thought of them. They, they was dirt. They, they, they was dogs. That's, that's, that's what they thought of them. But Jesus took time to talk to that woman. He took time to heal her daughter. And I, I thought that that was awesome, that God would take the time out of his day. When, you know, when she talks about that uh, even the children would eat like the crumbs, you know, I know that's talking about Israel and different things there, but it really ministered to me that Jesus took his time to minister to her. It took faith for her to even approach Jesus. But she was tenacious about it, and she wasn't going to be stopped. And that's what we got to do. We got to take our faith, and we got to be strong in it, and we have got to take it. If you need something from God, you've got to have faith. You got to have faith to believe God. You couldn't get saved unless you believed He was going to save you, and it took faith to get you there. Man, I didn't know that you had to have faith. I just knew that I needed help and that I was coming from a gutter that I didn't want to ever go back into. And when he reached down and saved me, let me tell you something. I knew I was saved. I knew God saved me. I knew he did. And you didn't have to tell me that that was faith. I just had it to know. And I, you know, it's like they say, you have faith like the seed of a mustard seed, like the... You know, it don't take much. You just got to have faith to believe. There are things in your life, and there's, there's people here tonight, maybe, maybe it ain't for you, maybe it's for the people on the Internet, I don't know. But there's people here that you need faith to believe for things. Listen, I believe to go overseas. I didn't have the money to go. And I thought, I'll just stay at home. I'd stay at home, but yet I'd put a dollar here and something here and there, and I kept thinking, man, I want to go. I know that I'm called to go overseas. I know that I'm supposed to go over there. That's my calling, people. I'm an evangelist. I didn't know that. I didn't know that until I came to church here. I had no idea. Now, I don't feel that there's an anointing gets on me over there that all. Uh, I understood when Roy said up here one time that there was differences in the anointings. Let me tell you something. When the anointing gets on me over there, man, I do crazy things. I mean, it, it, it's wild. When I'm here, it's different. There's different, you know, I can get wild. I, I probably would if I went on any further, but I'm, I'm going to cut this thing because I know it's, you know, I know everybody's got to go to work and, but um, one more thing I want to say, you know, we go through tests. We go through trials. And our faith is tried through those tests. And when our faith is, when, you know, if you, if you don't go through a test, how are you going to know if you got faith? You know, many a time I've been slapped in the face, knocked down, with things that I thought should be mine or things that I should do. Lord, I thought by now I'd be the most smartest person on earth. I did. I, you know, I used to think that. I used to think, God, man, since I met you, there ain't nothing can stop me. But I learned. You know, it. you got to have faith. <laughs> like I say, there's people here, and, and under the sound of my voice, 
Your faith needs to be strengthened. You need to reach out more in faith. You know, you can, like for your healings and stuff like that, you know, it's not all us. It's God mostly. All he asked is that we have faith to believe. You know, in, in John, I think it's in the 14th chapter where Jesus is talking about believe on him. We need to believe hard in Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And it takes faith to follow him. It takes faith to get in the word every day and every night. It takes faith to get on your hands and knees and pray and seek God's face. It takes faith and determination to say, I'm not leaving this place until God hears me, until something changes, till that kid of mine gets in church. I'm not giving up. I believe by faith that they're saved. My whole family, and I got some heathens in my family. I mean some bad heathens. Dwayne knows them. But I'm believing by faith. They're coming in, and they're coming in soon. And so, you know, I... I'm going to end this. If you think that you can't, if, if you think that you don't have faith, that you're not strong in your faith, listen, God will bring something across your path that will show you where you're at in faith. He'll show you. Ask him to. He'll show you. If there's anybody here that wants me to pray for them to, to strengthen their faith or, or whatever, you have any needs, anything like that, I'm willing to pray for you. But that's all I got. God bless you. I'm cutting it off. I heard someone say on TV today that that the faith to move the mountain was the faith to see the mountain jump. <clears throat> and I I was thinking about that today and I was thinking that's not the way that I believe it. I believe that mountains has got to move. It's the faith to to move a mountain and say to this mountain go out into the sea, disappear. And, uh, and, and we have a faith for that because we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and we, if we have a, just a mustard seed faith, we can say to that mountain, be removed. And so that's talking about a mountain being removed, not jumping. But I thought that was kind of interesting he said that today. Um, let's go ahead and, uh, and close tonight with prayer. And... Um, Uh, Donna, uh, you want to take a minute or two? You you don't want to? Okay. All right. Well, let's just pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the messages we've heard tonight from our sisters, Lord. These are people that we know, people we love, that have lived hard times, and so have many of us, Lord. But, Lord, we just thank you for their messages tonight, and I believe they've touched hearts like they have mine tonight. I ask you, Father, that you'd watch over us all as we go out tonight and go to our homes. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, that you would uh, bless each one that's here. Bless each one spiritually, physically, and financially in every way. In Jesus' name, thank you, Jesus. Amen. God bless you.